Hello, my name is Kristen Berry, and I'd like to thank you for attending this virtual session, which is um, a really interesting coincidence because we're going to be talking about uh, virtual heritage and um, augmented realities in this presentation. So let's go ahead and begin. Following the rise of digital media and personal digital photography, the average historic site visitor has more ability than ever to influence the presented narrative of a particular place. For decades, archaeologists and historians have endeavored to meticulously research and piece together histories for public understanding of historic or heritage sites. Yet this work has become viewed less by the general public at times than internet accessible images and applications. With this significant rise in available digital media exacerbated by the evolution of smartphone and photographic technology, the general public is also able to more significantly impact the narrative presented to the outside world by providing images and updates on a regular basis and shared through the internet. These pictorial stories can be curated through engines such as Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest and present a mere snapshot view of history or heritage, which is easily transmitted worldwide. For heritage sites with already complicated historical pasts or living heritage cities, this additional media can begin to construct a passive crowdsourced narrative at the site outside traditional research paradigms and based on the popularity of photographs chosen for representation and shared. While the expert interpretation is still a predominant method, the volume and availability of amateur community user media provides a consistent program for engaging these viewpoints in the interpretation. These impressions must be mediated for physical or virtual tourists who are asked to understand place through the available information. For living history cities such as Columbus, Indiana in the American Midwest, digital technology may provide this mediation, helping tourists access accurate information about the history and artifacts while promoting the coexistence or symbiosis of the population with the heritage. Personal photography and tourism is at an all-time high. The proliferation of smartphones means that digital photographs are easy to reproduce and cost little to publish. Unlike previous efforts where film would have to be processed and manually shared, digital photographs can be shared for free through social media and stored in the palm of a person's hand. The sheer number of photographs shared publicly is the latest evolution of a trend in tourism known as, quote, I was here tourism, end quote, that was popularized by Bell and Lyell in 2005. The phenomenon describes the perpetuation of various storage images that are reproduced in an effort to establish a personal position within a tourism landscape. As these images are taken and shared, other public entities view the images, visit the site, and recreate the image only to share it again with additional people. This gives precedence to certain imagery and generates narratives associated with those images that are out of the control of the heritage site being visited. So the, the reference I give here is of course, everybody who used to stand in front of uh, the Pisa Campanile and attempt to recreate the same image. Not only are visitors now able to relay images of a place, but to also include their perceptions and associations of the material when it's presented, such as this example of the uh, archeological site of ancient Troy and some of these impressions on Instagram. This presents both significant opportunities and challenges to heritage sites that have a particular narrative that they wish the public to understand and may impact interpretive planning strategies and distribute control of the narrative to outside forces. The Susan Song, as Susan Sontag famously suggests, to collect photographs is to collect the world, although for Sontag, the ability to share pictures was dependent on having them printed. While film photography and physical photographs are not as common nowadays, the public want to collect world monuments just as much as they ever have. These souvenirs can help to spread the knowledge of what exists at a site with the immediacy of which they can be shared with others. In recent years, however, social media has also become an established method of publicity and growing user bases for businesses, providing an ample platform from which to engage new audiences and heritage sites. If heritage sites are able to leverage this response by promoting Instagram or Twitter hashtags and using their own mobile applications for engagement, they can regain control of the site narrative and use social media and digital photography to their advantage. Alongside evidence of its power to promote even little known heritage sites, social and digital media also provides a platform for researchers investigating user interpretation by understanding successes and failures of presented material as it is later related to everyday patrons. 
social media may provide not only a paradigm shift in the way that sites communicate with patrons, but also in how they understand patron experiences. The traditional patron survey of 10 years ago is now being replaced with research into hashtags and captions and their ability to explain public takeaways and interests. Despite evidence that social media may be used to successfully promote heritage sites, site organizers should be wary of the crowdsourced method of collecting information and publicity, as well as the quickly evolving digital landscape and look of social media. The creation of new social media sites that quickly find audiences with younger members of society suggests that even the latest methods of utilizing social media have fallen by the wayside. As my students tell me, Facebook is no longer cool and I need to get Snapchat, for example. This suggests that to continue to have an impact through social media, organizers must be able to keep up with evolving platforms of intent on continuously engaging younger audiences. While the method of distribution may be slightly modified, however, the principle remains the same as it has been since the beginning of interpretive practice, engage the audience and provide accurate and authentic information. Crowdsourced information also reveals a number of biases of which site organizers should be wary. The possibility of promoting inaccurate or inauthentic information is, as, is high as the public is able to publish descriptions without specialized knowledge, experience, or peer review. Patrons post what they enjoyed and understood, which may not be the moments that site organizers wish to promote. Patrons angry about a particular moment in the interpretation or upset about something else entirely may not provide the most objective feedback for experiences, but this is a problem whether using social media or traditional sourcing methods. Social media is available worldwide and potential visitors can see all information related to a site from their cell phone or computer. As the patrons passively produce more of the publicly available narrative through social media and web platforms, the site risks being usurped by information from the general public and not historians or experts. When patrons have expanded ways of providing information, the site begins to lose control of the narrative for good or for bad. As with employing traditional methods of soliciting feedback, social media platforms require front-end investment, as these programs require people associated with the site to operate them, whether paid or volunteer. While marketing conglomerates are often employed to run commercial and social, commercial social, social media accounts, that investment must be significantly more than heritage sites can afford, particularly in times of financial insecurity. Sites may additionally run the risk of hired employees having less knowledge about the heritage site that they are promoting or accidentally or purposefully presenting views in contrast with the values of the site and thus incurring negative feedback or inauthentic promotion. There is a significant benefit to the growing trend towards smartphones and digital imagery in the ability of the average user to use smartphone applications, suggesting that using personal technology might be easier than learning new technology provided by the heritage site and extrapolate fewer expenses for heritage sites delivering digital presentations. As heritage sites shift between digital and physical audiences, new technologies are able to make the transition to accommodate both through augmented or computerized interpretations. Augmented reality or AR or virtual reality, VR, simulations or media provide a user experience which enhances engagement through digital means, particularly amplifying the user's perceptions of objects, architecture, or space. When used as part of the informational interpretation, both augmented reality and virtual reality are able to provide additional digital media to supplement a stationary object, at times allowing the visitor to choose which enhanced media is depicted. While VR requires additional hardware, such as headsets, and potentially a full monitor system, AR can provide, uh, can better utilize mobile application technology, making AR more available to the general public with less investment. Johnson and Smith suggested in 2005 that the use of AR would become more commonplace in a number of different disciplines, including museum and heritage design in the following years. And many heritage sites have invested in technology to meet this demand. In 2017, for example, the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC, introduced a free augmented reality mobile application and web platform titled Skin and Bones that works in tandem with their Bone Hall exhibition to enhance visitor understanding of the skeletons displayed in their collection. Amid the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, many heritage sites began offering virtual tours through mobile and desktop applications, making an engaging experience even more personal while quarantined. 
Mobile AR and informational applications also provide an important benefit to patrons with vision or hearing impairments. This ability has been explored since the beginning of the 21st century, producing accommodations that allow for digital reading and spatial awareness for visitors with vision impairments and enhanced white noise reduction and visual interpretation for visitors with hearing impairments. The use of inclusive technology and augmented displays at heritage sites not only provide inclusion for patrons with impairments, but also an engaging interpretation for the general patron. In contrast to accommodating based on legal requirement, the technology has the opportunity to engage multiple types of learning styles, including auditory, visual, or kinesthetic learning, alongside accommodation, as each of these requires particular associated strategies. As these technologies become more available at heritage sites, traditional interpretation methods of single or multi-language stationary signage may soon be completely replaced with interactive interpretations aimed at multiple user groups. The emerging availability of virtual and augmented technologies to meet the rising need of the average or specialized heritage visitor also coincides with the ability to develop less or non-invasive strategies for the interpretation of heritage sites. While many sites employ non-invasive strategies to protect sensitive materials or landscapes, these strategies can also be a benefit to living, functioning heritage cities that experience substantial tourism. Columbus, Indiana is one such city with extensive architectural heritage, much of which remains privately owned and inaccessible to the public. This constraint, however, has not discouraged visitors who travel to Columbus in the hundreds of thousands each year to see these magnificent pieces of architecture. The city houses seven United States national landmark buildings and numerous other buildings, sculptures, and landscapes designed by world famous designers dating to the mid 19th century. The investment in Columbus, which was a relatively small Midwestern city, was due in large part to J. Irwin Miller, chairman of the Cummins Engine Company during the, that period of time, which felt that enhancing the city with exciting modern design would attract better employees for his company and factory. His personal and family investments in local churches and other religious institutions that followed suit resulted in three of the National Historic Landmarks. Here, you're seeing two of them here. First Christian Church, North Christian Church, and First Baptist Church. Additionally, Miller invested in buildings for his own company with Aero Saarinen designing the Irwin Union Bank and even Miller's house. In 1960, the Cummins Foundation developed its own architecture program that focused on educational innovation, granting money to schools to hire signature architects for their new buildings. The first grant was given to Lillian C. Schmidt Elementary School to pay the design fees for Harry Weiss. Another prominent elementary school was later designed by Carl Warnicke, a California architect who encouraged communication with the outdoors in his architectural design of Mabel McDowell Elementary School. The school became a National Historic Landmark. A total of 52 projects by elite architects of date were completed and include most of the public buildings around the city, such as schools, parks, fire stations, the city hall, the community jail, memorials, and golf courses. As a result of this dense collection of historic buildings and landscapes in Columbus, the city provided an ideal opportunity to explore less or non-invasive interpretation strategies. As most of the landmark buildings remain privately owned, interpretation through non-physical means is necessary to make these spaces available to the public. The Columbus, Indiana Augmented Reality Application Project was developed to meet these specific needs for the city. The aggregation of monuments in the living city is substantial, so signage would detract from the overall functioning. Instead, a mobile application ensures that the information is available at all times and accommodates visitors with hearing and visual impairments without leaving a permanent footprint in the city. As a way to introduce concepts of digital interpretation to the next generation of heritage interpreters, the project was incorporated into an immersive learning seminar at Ball State University, which utilized assignments intended to make students think about digital heritage techniques and how skill sets might be developed. The seminar included students from the Ball State University architecture program who visited Columbus twice and made determinations on their understanding as a tourist. Students produced digital models of the landmark buildings based on original architectural drawings provided by partnerships with the Columbus, Indiana Architectural Archives and Ball State University Drawings and Documents Archive. Extensive primary and secondary source information um, was gathered and paired with the digital models to provide context and information for visitors to replicate that use of traditional signage. 
The seminar was intended to provide the content for the application at which time at the, which the time of this presentation is in funding status to provide for the programming. This eventual application and web platform will be constructed by professionals as part of the Ball State um, IDIA lab, which has developed the technology to produce the application and recently launched a similar virtual uh, companion application for Mounds State Park in Indiana. The Columbus, Indiana application is scheduled for testing in 2020. While the Columbus, Indiana mobile application is being developed to benefit the city, it reintroduces previously discussed challenges, particularly the cost to produce such an endeavor up front and the ability of the city itself to continue to utilize and update it. The Columbus, Indiana application was developed as part of the university program and will be supported through grant funding, which means that the heritage sites themselves are not taking on the cost of the production. Once the application is handed over to Columbus Area Visitor Center, however, it will be up to the city tourism staff to update it as needed over time. This suggests investment by the city. Important to note, however, is that all means of interpretation require updating and associated funding. In the United States, there are a number of granting organizations, including the National Endowment for the Humanities, that are specifically investing in digital strategies, which provide some relief for heritage sites. In an increasingly digital world, particularly one where the average traveler or tourist carries at least one digital mobile device, the use of these often free services can attract new audiences and eliminate the need for external or rentable hardware, which will be increasingly beneficial in the post-COVID-19 tourism environment. If a visitor's personal device is available to provide the service for free, heritage and historic sites can subsequently eliminate the need for audio or printed media in multiple languages, offering a democratic approach to information sourcing. Additionally, previous investments into the procuring and printing of such translations could be instead invested into the upkeep and modification of the digital platforms, where information is updated as discoveries are made. Augmented in reality and virtual reality applications provide a universal space for interpretation, making information about heritage structures accessible to a wide audience and present the opportunity to engage the public in demolished or partially existing structures as well. As well. And what you're looking at here is an example of that from Gary, Indiana, um, the Un City United Methodist Church, uh, which was abandoned and fell into significant disrepair as a result. So with augmented and virtual technology, we can bring some of these types of buildings back to life so that the public can better understand them and therefore better invest in them. With endless possibilities, a studied approach to virtual engagement is necessary to develop a timeless, authentic interpretation. So that concludes my presentation. I thank you very much uh, for listening and watching, and I look forward to any feedback and comments that I may receive through email. Thanks very much.